writing is a navigation tool in some sense. You think about where you're going so you can test out the route before you implement it. That's all associated with thought, and the deepest form of thought is writing. It's the deepest form. My students in my fourth year seminar were very good students. I asked them to write three essays, and the first essays were, they were terrible. And I started to think through, when I was assessing an essay, well, what was I assessing? Use the correct words, then put them in the proper phrases, and then the phrases should be organized into sentences that are grammatically coherent. Then you have to organize the sentences within each paragraph. And then your paragraphs have to be sequenced so that the essay exists as a coherent and meaningful totality. And so then I wrote a guide to writing and just made that explicit. This is what you're doing when you're writing, and you have to edit at every single one of those levels. When my students in my fourth year seminar went through this process, they inevitably produced the best essay they'd ever written. So I took this writing manual, I discussed it a lot with my son and his team. Hi, I'm Julian Peterson. Uh, I wouldn't say founder of essay in that situation, though. <laughs> hey, I'm Julian Peterson. I guess I'm not. So we started working on this how long ago now on essay? Well, we've really started working on it, I think, in 2019. You were very interested in the idea of, of creating educational tools online, and we noticed on your website that the documents that you produced for your students had been downloaded 150,000 times. So I was like, okay, that's, that's an interesting piece of information. Whenever we had thought about building something based off of this document, it was always kind of like a course idea. But what would be really cool is to build something that incorporated all of the tools and philosophical elements of that process and just build it into the software. I do think it's a revolutionary program in some sense because word processing technology really hasn't changed that much since about 1985. Essay's value compared to other word processors is that we offer a more structured writing environment. It's a tool that will allow you to get your thoughts down and then make sure that they're clear and well structured. We really want to focus on the writer improving their own ideas. Why did you decide that working on this with me was a good idea? Well, I mean, part of it was, was that I, I know that writing is important. The impact of writing on oneself, it's the way you organize your own thinking. You can lay out what you think. What do I think? You just watch. Okay, I have a problem. What do I think about that? I think this, I think this, I think this. I think this, I think this, and I don't know much about that, but I'm interested, so I better read this, and now I think this. You write all that down, just so you know who you are, and then you think, okay, let's sort this mess out. You create your character with your words, you mark your path forward with your thoughts. Every word matters, intonation matters, connotation matters, poetic beauty matters. And if it doesn't matter, then you're not writing, and if you're not writing, you're not thinking, and if you're not thinking, then you're going to fall into a pit. That's how serious you are if you think words matter. And they matter. They matter more than anything. One of the reasons that we believe in this product, an essay, is to help people learn to work through their ideas before communicating them. The university students who are learning to write well-structured arguments, people trying to write compelling emails, people who struggle with communication generally in their careers. If people got in the habit of editing their writing and their thinking, and thinking critically about their own ideas, then you know the world would be a much better place. To essay means to attempt, to try. It's a lovely word to, to use as the signifier for the program because we're trying to get people to try.
Aim up, man. Aim up and put everything you have behind it. Peterson. I'm a professor and a clinical psychologist and an author. I've written three books, Maps of Meaning, 12 Rules for Life, and Beyond Order. Uh, the last two became quite popular. I've taught at Harvard and at the University of Toronto, at McGill. I've lectured all over the world at places like Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Stanford, etc., the usual criminals. I've started this academy, uh, educational academy, that I'm doing lectures for, and I'm hoping to bring you the highest quality content that we can find and produce, and I'd like to invite you along for the ride. Good evening and welcome to Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's Beyond Order 12 More Rules for Life Tour. Note, during tonight's presentation, video, audio, and flash photography is prohibited, and we have a strict zero-tolerance policy for any heckling or disruptions. And now, please welcome Tammy Peterson. Wow, what a place. You guys all came here at the same time. We were in a traffic jam for quite a while, but someone let us in and we got here. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of, it's been so good to be in Australia. Um, we've been here, this is the second time. I mean, it's summer here, right? It's winter at home. So even just that. But really what it's all about is coming here and speaking to you. Jordan's going to come out, he's going to give you a lecture. And then after that, we're going to sit and do a Q&A. You've submitted some questions on Slido, and uh, I'll choose a few questions. And whatever time is left, we'll, we'll answer what we can. I'm just going to take a minute of your time. Uh, he's going to talk about Beyond Order, so I'm going to talk about one of the rules. And it is a difficult rule. Difficult rule number 11, do not allow yourself to become resentful, deceitful, or arrogant. I'm going to talk a little bit about arrogance, if I can. When I was young, 14, I quit going to church. I started doing yoga. I thought, I don't need, I don't need that Protestant family church anymore. And I did yoga every day. I was pretty devoted. It was a practice, there's no doubt about it. I think I did it every day till I was about 55 years old. So it was, I took it seriously. Uh, when, when we got married, George said, you're gonna have to tell the truth. And I thought, yeah, okay. Nobody had ever asked me that before. So I carried a Bible around in my pocket for about a year, trying to decide whether I could do this or not, and I decided that it was very much worthwhile, and so we got married. And um, I was still, you know, I was raised very independent, to be very independent, and it, it served me well for a very long time until in 2017 we went on our first tour and came here. And I sat in the crowd every night and uh, thought about, what am I doing here? And why am I traveling with my husband? But I was, I was listening. I, la I listened to every lecture. And I kept asking myself what I was doing there. And then at the end of that tour, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, 
they told me it wasn't going to be very serious, but it turned out that after they'd done my first surgery, they found out I had 10 months to live. And I was in the doctor's office and I thought, um, okay. I just accepted what he had to say. I thought, well, you know, I've had relatives who've died in their 50s. Maybe I'm going to die in my 50s. Maybe that's the way life goes. And uh, I put up my chin and, you know, was feeling my usual toughness. And I decided that that was something I could take on. And I went home to tell my family and I saw the grief in my son's eyes. He wasn't accepting what they had said. And uh, I, uh, something happened and I still don't really understand it. It's going to take the rest of my life, I think, to understand it. But I realized that it wasn't just about truth. It was about gratitude and I hadn't had enough gratitude for my life, for myself, for my family, for the opportunity to get up every day and to go to bed having, having just been there and been in awe of being able to carry on one day after the next. You know, I, after I was sick and I got better, I thought I'd better keep paying attention to this arrogance because it did come up and the resentment would come up. One day I was sitting, I was in the basement where I have my art table and I was walking by my art table and I thought I would sit down to paint or draw. And I heard a voice in my head saying no. And I, and I was listening to myself, right? I was practicing listening because I realized that I'd been missing this gratitude. I'd just been living in a very forceful way, force, forcing life to go in a, the way that I thought was best. But now I was listening and I heard myself say no and I thought, what's, what's that? What do you mean no? <laughs> this is something that you want to do. Where did that come from? So I learned to pause, to listen and then to pause. To pause and to ask. Knowing that I didn't know what was going on. And I couldn't make the next move. Because I wasn't listening, I had to pause and I had to wait. And I had to reflect on my feelings and my thoughts and recognize that I was insufficient in my knowledge of what the next thing was to do. But if I was more patient with myself and accepting that I was you know, someone who was learning that I could get an answer, and I would get an answer. One day I was down, I was in a Zoom art class, you know, through COVID, we, all we did was Zoom this and Zoom that. And uh, Dr. Peterson came down the stairs to ask me a question or something, I don't know. And I was in my Zoom class, and uh, he said something to me. And I thought, he knows I'm in a class, and I kind of looked at him in a snippy way. And uh, I thought, what was that? You know, what, what was the use of that? Why couldn't I just say, you know, I'm in a class? Just, you know, answer in a very non-judgmental way. I'm in a class. You know, I'll be another 20 minutes. But I didn't, I didn't take that kind and gentle way. Instead, it was a, like a an arrogant, uh, resentful kind of way. So I stopped and I paused and I thought about it and I realized I didn't know what was going on because I don't know what's going on. I know I'm up here with you guys and I don't know what's going on and I don't know why you're here. And maybe you don't know why you're here, but you came here. There's a reason you're coming here. 
you're coming here to listen to Dr. Peterson. And he's sitting down there meditating on what he's going to say. Because he doesn't even know what he's going to say. And he knows he doesn't know what he's going to say. And I think that's the magic of what he's about. And I've learned that. I don't know what the next thing is. I have to wait. And I will be informed. If I pay attention and I watch, I'll get signs of what needs to come next. But it won't be what I think has to come next. And that's what I think, do not allow yourself to come, become resentful, deceitful, or arrogant. I think that's what that means, or at least that's what it means to me. And with that, I would like you to help me welcome my husband, Dr. Gary. largest audience that I've spoken to, so... grateful in spite of your suffering and so I'll tell you a story first from the Brothers Karamazov Dostoevsky novel it's a great novel uh, if you read it every other novel will seem bloodless afterwards it's an unbelievable work of genius, especially if you're psychologically minded. Now, if you're more of a sociologist or someone interested in politics, in the sort of broad scale movement of people, then Tolstoy might be the author for you. But if you're interested in the insane complexity of the human spirit, then Dostoevsky is definitely your author, and part of the Brothers Karamazov is a battle of character in some sense between two brothers. There are more brothers in the story, and the novel isn't only about these two brothers, but it's a major, it's the major element of the plot, I would say. And uh, it's a real tour de force. So one of the brothers, Ivan, is a very charismatic, attractive, rational, compelling intellect. And he has a younger brother, Alyosha, who doesn't have his charisma or his capacity to make an explicit argument. And Ivan is a rationalist, materialist, atheist. And Alyosha is a novice in a monastery. And the book is extraordinarily interesting, in part because Ivan and Alyosha are at odds with one another about, about the existence of God. Or even deeper than that, they, they argue about, in some sense, whether the world that God created is so cruel that it's immoral to posit a good God. It's even a deeper argument than just belief. And Ivan, 
He pulls out all the stops. Ivan is one of the most potent atheist characters ever written, and it's a real testament to Dostoevsky's moral courage and genius as a, an author and a thinker, because when Dostoevsky did what he could to explore a topic, he produced the ultimate steel man. So, I'll give you another example. In Crime and Punishment, which is, I think Crime and Punishment is the best novel ever written. That's my personal feeling. Not that I've read every novel that's ever been written, but I've read a lot of great novels, and for me, it stands above head and shoulders. And Dostoevsky, his main character in that novel, Raskolnikov, commits a murder. And the, the question that Dostoevsky is investigating is, in some sense, is there a moral order to the soul and the world? And so what he does to investigate that is he gives Raskolnikov all the reasons he can think of why it would be appropriate to kill someone. So the woman that this student, starving law student Raskolnikov decides to kill is a vicious, sadistic, oppressive tyrant who tortures her niece, who's mentally challenged, who's a landlady who makes life miserable for everybody that she encounters. Simultaneously, Raskolnikov's sister is basically decided to prostitute herself to an older man in her village that she doesn't love so that she can find enough money to keep supporting him in law school. And so Raskolnikov thinks, I could just kill my landlady, I could take her money, I could free her niece, I could stop my sister from engaging in a, a doomed life. How, why would that be bad? And what's really stopping me? And in Raskolnikov's mind, he's a, a Nietzschean in some real sense. He believes in the will to power, he believes in the primacy of rationality, he doesn't think there's any intrinsic moral structure in the world. He thinks that the only thing that stops him from moving forward with this courageous murder is sheer cowardice. And, and that's a deep idea too. One of the things that the German philosopher Nietzsche proposed was that much of what passes for morality among people is just cowardice. It isn't that you're good, it's just that you're afraid to do the bad things you really want, and that that's not really morality. And Raskolnikov tortures himself with these ideas, and he, he ends up killing his landlady. And of course, like they do in life, things go terribly wrong, and he also ends up killing her mentally challenged niece, and, but he gets away with it. And the remainder of the novel, that's very well set up, it's very intricately plotted, it's very exciting murder mystery, because Crime and Punishment is a very well plotted thriller. He, he gets away with it. And then Dostoevsky spends the remainder of the book investigating the effect of the crime on Raskolnikov's soul. And uh, suffice it to say that he, he convicts himself, not least because he is not the same person before the murder and after the murder. Right? The whole world flips on him. And so the book, which is very gripping, is a detailed examination of the catastrophe of severe moral error. Ivan is treated the same way Raskolnikov is. So Ivan's a charismatic atheist. Dostoevsky organized all the arguments he could find that were really Enlightenment rationalist arguments for the non-existence of God, and then combined those with moral arguments as well. And in one scene, Ivan is tormenting Alyosha for the naivety and foolishness of his belief, and Dostoevsky uses Ivan to describe an event that actually happened in, in the Russia of the time. Uh, a mother and father of a young girl who were very, they were very sadistic and very punitive, and they locked her in an outhouse overnight when it was freezing cold, and she hammered on the doors and screamed, and froze to death in the night. And that was widely reported in the papers of the time. And Dostoevsky 
uses that event to allow Ivan to formulate an argument against the existence of God. And so he confronts Eliosha with this occurrence and he says to him essentially, would you torture one single girl to death in that manner to allow the world to continue? And there's a real deep question under that, which is, is existence itself, which is predicated on a deep suffering, morally justifiable? And Alyosha is defenseless in the face of the argument. He understands, because he's actually a good person, he understands that he wouldn't do that, and Ivan knows that, and he isn't able to formulate a justification either for God, let's say, and, and the fact that the world's constituted in a way that would allow such terrible things to happen. He can't formulate a moral justification for that God. And you might ask, what does that have to do with any of us? What does that have to do with, with me as an individual? I think it has a lot to do with all of us because one of the one thing we all have to struggle with is the fact that the world is steeped in suffering that's true in our own lives and it's true in everyone's life it's true on the psychological front let's say it's true socially politically there's no shortage of arbitrary catastrophe in the world and worse there's no shortage of malevolent catastrophe. So it's not only that terrible things happen to people because life is tragic, but unbelievably brutal things happen to people also because of the existence of malevolence. And Ivan's challenge to Eliosha is, how can you claim either that being itself is justified in the face of tragedy and malevolence, or even more profoundly claim that The God that has created this both exists and is good. And Eliosha is unable to formulate a response. One of the questions that women face now is analogous to this, to the issue that Ivan broaches with Eliosha before we had at least quasi-reliable birth control, the issue of procreation wasn't exactly voluntary. Just like it isn't exactly, in some sense, for animals. It's like it was going to happen if you engaged in sexual conduct. You were going to have children. It was part of life, and whether or not it was justifiable, in some real sense, was irrelevant. But as soon as birth control became a possibility, then a moral issue entered the arena. And the issue is, I met very few women, and very few men for that matter, who haven't been tortured by this question to some degree. It's like, how can I justify bringing into a world like this? And that's quite a question, because the world right now is a lot better than the world's been most of the time throughout human history, and so, if by a lot, and so if that question is still paramount in people's minds now, just imagine how difficult it is in some sense to justify the continuation of consciousness throughout all the centuries past that were much more cataclysmic than our current time. And you might say, well, that objection is a mere screen, let's say, smoke screen. People aren't willing to bear the responsibility of having a child, and so they drum up quasi-moral reasons not to do it. And I would say there's something to that, but, but there's something to the alternative, too. You know, one of the statues that I've seen in person that 
has had the biggest effect on me is Michelangelo's Pieta. It's a great statue. It's the statue of Mary, the mother of God, uh, with her son on her lap. She's holding him in her arms. He's an adult. It's after he's been taken off the cross. He's broken. Michelangelo, I believe, made that when he was 24. It's a stunning piece of work. It's an absolute work of genius. And I've often thought about it as the equivalent of the female crucifixion. And well, what does that mean? As well, the de it's the destiny of a mother to give up her child to be broken by the world. Right? In fact, in, in some strange sense, it's actually, that's actually at the core of what constitutes appropriate motherhood, because the reverse would be to protect your child at all cost from everything, and the consequence of that is, well, then you become the danger to your child. That, that's the, one of the consequences, but... The alternative to that is to encourage your child to go out in the world and seek his or her eventual destruction. And this is a real conundrum because if you're the, the psychoanalyst, Freud, I, I believe this is a Freudian phrase, the good mother necessarily fails. And so what does that mean? It means that as your child matures, you withdraw your overarching, the overarching security that you can provide as a mother say to an infant, that total security, you withdraw that incrementally and allow your child to go out and, and clash with the world. And if the world is such a terrible place, then in what way is that justifiable? And even if you have decided to have a child, there are going to be multiple micro decisions as your child matures that still involve the same conundrum. It's like, are you going to participate in exposing those you love to the risk of life? And how do you justify that? Now in the Brothers Karamazov, Ivan wins all the arguments, but Elosia is the better person. And one of the advantages that literature has over philosophy is that literature can enable the characterization of someone, right? The dramatic presentation of someone in a manner that's compelling ethically without having to provide an explicit argument. You can show if you're a great author, you can show through the manner in which the person reveals themselves in all of their interactions, the integrity of their character. And you can do that even if you can't simultaneously have that character formulate an explicit justification for their goodness. And so Ivan is compelling and he wins all the arguments, but he is definitely not the better man. And one of the things that's so unbelievably brilliant about the Brothers Karamazov is that Dostoevsky is able to show that. And he does the same thing in another book, The Idiot. Prince Mishkin is a holy fool. He's, he's clearly a literary representative of Christ in some real sense, but he's His goodness isn't in his intellectual prowess or his capacity for explicit description or, his, his, or in his ability even to formulate the nature of his own ethic. His goodness is all in, embedded in the manner in which he interacts with people and Dostoevsky just shows that and so what he shows, and this is one of the things that makes him such a powerful writer, is how faith, whatever that is, and we'll get into that, can manifest itself in character despite even being opposed by an explicit, say, a religious philosophy that is antagonistic to that. And maybe in some sense even, even despite believing that philosophy, even despite the person who's being good believing that philosophy themselves. And so, what Dostoevsky showed is that there's a realm of character that's deeper than the realm of explicit belief. 
And, well, that's very interesting. It's very interesting. If, if that's true, it's very interesting. That you can be good, let's say, despite not being able to explain how or why. And in fact, I would say, in some real sense, to the degree that you are good, you're good despite not being able to explain how or why, just as if you're malevolent, you're also malevolent without precisely being able to explain how or why, right? We're all deeper than our explanations of ourselves. There's all, all of us have more to us than what we understand and can say. I had a discussion a, a while back with a philosopher named Benatar, David Benatar, and he's an antinatalist. And uh, the antinatalists believe explicitly that life is so catastrophic, so rife with tragedy and malevolence that it's actually immoral to work for its continuation. And so the explicit antinatalist, antinatalist so that means anti-birth, right, antinatalist, philosophy is that if you were a good person, you would cease bringing vulnerably conscious creatures into existence. That the whole game should just fold up and disappear. That being itself, given its mortal limitations and the existence of the proclivity for adversarial atrocity is so ethically appalling that there is no justification for it. And I can understand that argument. I, I have some sympathy for that argument in that there's no doubt that extraordinarily deep suffering in the face of tragedy exists, and there's no doubt that a malevolence that's so corrosive that encountering it is traumatizing also exists. And the fact of those two existences, let's say, tragedy and malevolence, does present a powerful challenge to anyone who claims that existence is justifiable, and certainly to anyone who claims that existence is intrinsically good, and even more so to anyone who claims that that spirit who gave rise to existence is intrinsically good. And these emotional arguments that are predicated on distaste for the catastrophe of life often inform the arguments of rationalist atheists more than you think. I've talked to a lot of atheists and certainly thought many of the thoughts that atheists typically think, the doubtful thoughts, and, but I've been struck when I've spoken with deep atheists, let's say, how appalled they are about the structure of existence and how much that fact of being appalled actually informs their disbelief. So I talked to Stephen Fry, for example, and Stephen Fry is a great British actor. He's a very deep person. He's a very admirable person. I've met him a couple of times. Uh, we differ in many ways. I would say we differ to some degree politically. Uh, but he's the sort of person whose force of character strikes you on immediately on encounter. Extraordinarily erudite, unbelievably well-educated, very poetic in his speech, graceful, urbane, polite, clear-headed, compelling in his speech. Really quite a remarkable person. And I was having a discussion with him about the question at hand was something like, is it possible for the, for the civilization that erected itself in the West, which you're all part of, to maintain its structure in the absence of a theological or metaphysical substrate? And I believe the answer to that is no. In, in fact, I believe the technical answer to that is no. I don't think it's technically possible. I'm actually writing about that now. The next book that I'm writing is called We Who Wrestle With God, uh, which is a title I'm quite happy about. That's the meaning of the word Israel, by the way. So the chosen people of God are the people who wrestle with God. It's a very interesting idea. And part of that book will be an investigation into 
the metaphysical substrate of, of, of the psyche and the social order. So Fry said, he got quite upset in, in one part of the conversation. He, 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 he talked about what he would say to God if he met him face to face. And I don't know if this was something that he had personally experienced, but he was very agitated about the fact of a degenerative bone cancer in children. And I suspect that had a personal twist for him. It's a terrible thing to watch a child suffer through some catastrophic illness that seems utterly unrelated to their own moral culpability, let's say. And when you're in that situation, as a parent, let's say, or as someone who loves that child, I think it's worse in many ways than having that illness yourself. And of course, the, the, the horror of it is exaggerated by the fact that it's happening to someone who's innocent and who's just starting their life. And, and Fry really, in some sense, shook his fist at God during the conversation, which was quite interesting because he portrayed himself as atheistic. And if you're atheistic, there isn't really anyone to shake your fist at. But that didn't stop the impulse from making itself manifest. And so, and as I said, it's, it's not difficult to have some sympathy for that perspective. And so, now, this attitude disturbed me, even though I'm an admirer of Fry, and I could understand it. The reason it disturbed me is because I've watched where that attitude goes. You know, if you're, if you believe that existence itself is somehow corrupt in its essence because of the existence of tragedy and malevolence, and you believe that it's therefore ethical, say, to work for its cessation, it's very difficult for that belief system not to escape from its hypothetical enclosure and start wreaking havoc in the world. So here's an example. I spent quite a lot of time analyzing the writings of one of the Columbine high school shooters, and I think his name was Klebold. I shouldn't really say his name. Uh, to be a high school shooter takes a lot of preparation. You don't just decide that overnight. You have to brood on your resentment and your arrogance for months or years, and you have to brood deeply. You have to fantasize nonstop. You have to let what you have to let the spirit that needs to possess you in order to do that take you over completely. And that's not easy. You have to engage in a creative union with that bitterness and resentment. And this shooter who planned way more carnage than he was able to pull off, by the way, and who had literally had apocalyptically genocidal fantasies, justified that in part on the basis of his right to be the judge of being itself. He actually says that explicitly, that he or whatever possesses him, is the judge of being, he found it wanting, it should be eradicated. Now, that's not the same argument that Dave Benatar was making, that the world is so corrupt that consciousness itself should come to a halt, but it's not, it's a place where that argument can slip very easily. And my intuition is that if you become bitter and resentful about the structure of existence, its tragedy and its malevolence, then the fact of that bitterness and resentment is going to manifest itself in a manner 
that will inevitably make the very thing that you're opposing morally worse, not better. If you, if you stand up as the judge of existence and you find it wanting and you shake your fish, fist at the sky and you gather to yourself the right to do that, then then everything bad around you is about to get a lot worse. And if it was the fact that things were bad to begin with that justified your attitude, then there's no logical coherence in pursuing a path that's actually going to make that worse. Now you might ask yourself, does the adoption of that attitude the attitude that the tragedy and malevolence of being is so cardinal that the moral validity of being itself is questionable. Does that necessarily lead to a more dire end? And I don't know if it necessarily does, and I don't think anyone has a final answer to such things, but I've looked into that as deeply as I could, and I think with some degree of detachment, because I was actually curious about the question and motivated to formulate an answer and my conclusions was that it inevitably makes things worse. There's a prideful arrogance in that resentful judgment that leads anyone who entertains such notions down a dark road. So what's the alternative? Well, you know, I'm not much of a fan of naivety. Because you might say, well, you're, don't be so pessimistic. The world's not such a dark place. It's like, yeah, it is. And, and worse, if you're so naive that you don't think it is because you don't know or haven't looked or have been protected, and you ever encounter someone who's truly dark, even if that person happens to be you, they will take you out. So one of the risk factors for post-traumatic stress disorder is extended immature dependence. So if you're a naive person, and so you're a person who's, say, willfully blind in your optimism, and you do encounter something that's tragic and malevolent, that the union is the best, then the probability that you'll come out of that severely damaged is proportionate to the degree of malevolence that you've encountered and the naivety that you brought to bear on the situation to begin with. So, merely being unaware of the problem is not a solution to the problem. And if you have been scarred by tragedy or bitten by malevolence, then that will knock the naivety out of you and make you more cynical and bitter. And it's also difficult for me to see that as anything but an improvement, peculiarly enough. Is it better to be once bitten and twice shy or naive? And I would say it's actually better to be once bitten and twice shy. Now there's a darkness that's associated with that because once your naivety has been shattered, then well, then you're in a darker place and you're thinking darker thoughts and it's hard to see how that's an improvement, right? Because it's, it's a journey down and not up, but sometimes to reach the next pinnacle, let's say you have to go down into the valley first. In fact, that's almost inevitably the case. So, and I, I had to deal with this in my clinical practice. I had clients who had suffered terribly tragic occurrences and, and who had often encountered malevolence in, in in their own actions and their own attitudes, but also at the hands of other people. And 
They've been battered out of their naivety and plummeted into the land of cynicism and despair. And that was causing them undue suffering and sometimes risking their lives. It was severe enough to push them in a suicidal direction. And so it was this very serious problem. And so I had to puzzle through what the alternative to that judgmental cynicism might be. And one of the alternatives, the antidotes, is gratitude. But it's worth exploring what that means. Because it's easy to confuse gratitude with cynicism, or it's, it's easy to, or with naivety, sorry. It's easy to confuse gratitude with naivety. It's like, well, the world's a wonderful place, and I'm grateful for its existence. Like, that's just not that helpful when terrible things come down the pipeline. It's simply not true. And so, a deeper question is, how is it possible that you can be grateful in the face of the reality of suffering and malevolence? And I think that's a fundamental question because that is the nature of reality in some real sense. And we all know this in a manner that's also in some sense undeniable. You cannot argue yourself out of your own pain. It, it announces itself as a reality. You can't argue yourself even out of your own anxiety. It's, it's there as a brute fact of existence. And you have to be blind as an adult not to have apprehended the presence of, well, let's say, of the kind of malevolence that drove the actions of the National Socialists in the 1930s. And you might not want to look at that, and, you know, that's perfectly understandable, but if you're an adult, you have to be pretty blind to not think that exists. That actually demands a blindness that borders on the criminal. So, so how do you, how is it possible to be grateful and even should you be grateful, given those preconditions? Or even are you grateful? So, so one of the things I thought through, and I wrote about this in this chapter, is well, how do people respond when someone they love dies? And this is a complicated question. So you have a parent, and, you're, and you lose them. And you know, maybe you had an ambivalent relationship with your mother or your father who's now departed, and that's highly probable because most people have somewhat ambivalent relationships with the people they love. And maybe you could, you could see the weaknesses in their character, and of course, they no doubt could see the weaknesses in yours, but you could see how they were imperfect and, and broken in some real sense, and how they labored under the limitations of their life. And maybe you could see the tragedy of their life, and you might think, especially if their life was particularly tragic, that you should think that it would be better if they had never existed at all. But you know, that isn't really how people react. And it's quite interesting to think this through. When, when someone close to you dies, you generally grieve. And what's quite remarkable about that is that's even the case if the person who dies has in some sense been quite profoundly limited and reprehensible. There's still a sense that, despite their flaws and their fragility, that their existence was at least worthwhile enough so that the corresponding appropriate emotion is grief for their non-existence. And so I would say grief, which you could think about as a necessary consequence of love, grief is actually a judgment that existence, no matter how limited, is valuable. And then you might ask yourself, well, do you think grief is justified? Because why not just have a party? And I don't, and, and you can walk through that logically in the manner that I have been walking through it, but then you, you have to contrast with that with what people actually do. And what people actually do is grieve. And that indicates that they love. And it indicates that they love in spite of limitation and even in spite of malevolence. And that love, in spite of limitation and malevolence, indicates that 
they judge that limited being to have been worthwhile. And I don't know if we render a deeper judgment on existence itself than the judgment we render when we grieve. And so then we can say if we're observing our deepest instincts in relationship to love itself, we observe that when push comes to shove, we conclude that even the most fragmented of existences was worthy of celebration. So that's something to think about. Because it's not exactly obvious why. And I think you can, you can think about that even more deeply. You know, you, you might think, well, I wish that my... I wish that my father, I wish that my mother... Or and you can think about this about anybody you know, had fewer flaws. I, it would be better if they had fewer flaws. But you wonder, that... Fair enough, and you want to encourage people's development, but it is also the case that when you love someone, you love them not precisely despite their peculiarities, but to some degree because of them, right? I mean, each person is a strange combination of remarkable possibility and, and surreal constraint. And, and those things, it's, like, it's like a genie, right? A genie is this immense force the root word of genius, by the way, is immense force that can do anything but that has this incredibly constrained being, right, the lamp. Uh, and that's what a human being is like, is this immense possibility conjoined with these strange, arbitrary, and sometimes unsettling constraints. And when you love someone, and then when you grieve when they're lost, the judgment is, in total, that combination of peculiar and particular limitation and possibility was worthy of celebration. We're, we're better off than it had occurred. And, and people often, when they have the opportunity to grieve, also reflect too, and they reflect they're often deeply hurt because they didn't take as much advantage of the fact of that person's presence as they might have. So many people, for example, are very upset if someone close to them dies because they hadn't had the opportunity, let's say, to reconcile with them properly or, or to communicate with them as deeply as now they know they might have in retrospect. And so, so I would say that when push comes to shove, the judgment we render on the limited being of the people we love is that it's worthy of celebration. In fact, that it's in some sense a moral, it's a sin to not grieve when someone dies. A sin is to miss the mark. You know? So, you know, in our deepest moments of grief, we can conclude, we conclude that existence itself is worth celebrating. Then you might ask, how should that attitude carry over into your day-to-day -day existence. And, and this, I think, speaks to the necessity of both faith and courage. Now, in the modern world, we tend to think of faith as the willingness to accept propositions that are on the face of them absurd. And so, the typical rationalist, atheistic objection to a set of religious propositions is that's not a very compelling description of the world. And the religious person might say, well, I believe that because I have faith. And the rationalist will say, well, you're just, it's just faith in something equivalent to a discredited and superstitious scientific theory. That's not faith, it's the, it's the murder of reason by blind, it's the murder of reason by willful blindness, and it's a form of weakness. And it, it's, it's very hard for religious people not to be set back on their heels by that kind of accusation. It's very hard for them to formulate a rejoinder. It's, and it's partly because they also believe that the propositions they abide by on the religious front are in the same category are of the same kind 
as, let's say, a scientific description of the world. And I just think that's simply not true. I think that whole mode of conceptualizing what constitutes faith just misses the mark completely. What's faith? Faith is what you have when you decide to get married. Right. So what? You laugh. You laugh. That's an, it's an interesting thing to, to have a statement like that produce laughter, right? Because that's a spontaneous response. And, and it means that the person who's made the comment that is in some sense witty has struck something that's true but not stated. And you know that it's true that you have to have faith to get married. And the reason you have to have faith is because what the hell do you know? Right? I mean, you're going to be leaping into the unknown with this person. First of all, you don't even know who you are. And you certainly don't know who you're going to become. And you know even less about them. And then you have no idea what's going to happen to the two of you when you get married. And yet you think, I'll take your hand and we'll jump off this cliff together and we'll enjoy the plummet downward. It's something like that. And you see in that situation that faith is necessary because you can't wait around to collect the evidence before you engage in the act. You have to leap into the unknown. And I would say, you're leaping into the unknown all the time. You may orient yourself in accordance with a set of principles to guide you, but do you know what you're doing when you take your next job? Do you know it's better than any other job you could have possibly taken? Do you know that the path of education that you take is the one that's right for you? And the answer is, you can't compute that before running the program. And that's actually the technical answer to that, some real sense, is that most of the things in your life, you only gather the evidence in relationship to most of the decisions that you make in your life long after you had to make the decision. And so, you move forward in faith, and that's that. And then the question is, well, what do you have faith in? And that's a good question. Maybe you lie now and then, or maybe quite often. And that would mean that you have faith in the power of deceit. That's what that means, because if you didn't, you wouldn't lie. Or maybe you don't lie, you try to tell the truth, and that means you have faith in what? Something like the redeeming power of truth? And the faith is manifest in your willingness to put yourself on the line for the truth, or to put yourself on, line, on the line for the deception. But either way, you're stuck with the fact that you don't know what the consequences will be before you undertake the action, and you have to leap into the unknown with that principle guiding your actions. And so, you're stuck with faith. Why? Because you're ignorant. And you fill the gap between your ignorance and the world with faith. And if you don't know what you, if you don't believe that, that, that just means either you don't have a very sophisticated, explicit description of how you behave, or you simply don't know what you have faith in. And so people will say, well, I have faith in nothing. Well, do you just lay in bed and not move? And, so, and sometimes that's the case. If, if you see people sometimes who are so depressed that they can't get out of bed. But most people who claim faithlessness aren't paralyzed. They're generally impulsive and hedonistic. And then what that means is they have faith in their impulsive hedonism. They're the whim of their hunger or their, or their addiction or their, or, their, or their sexual desire or their gluttony or their pride. They worship a lesser god. That's a good way of thinking about it. They have faith in the, they have faith in the notion that the gratification of the momentary impulses that seize them is the appropriate means of moving ahead in the world. So they have faith, it's just stunningly unsophisticated and counterproductive. And I would say counterproductive, because if you're impulsively hedonistic, your life will degenerate. And so will the lives of people around you. And so it's not a good medium to long-term iterable or repeatable game. And it's certainly not one that you can easily invite other people to play with you on a continuous basis. So, you're stuck with faith because you're ignorant and you're going to have faith in something and you might not know what it is. 
But that doesn't mean that you're not abiding in some manner by some faith. And that begs another question. What should you have faith in then? Well, well, this is where we can think about gratitude in a more sophisticated way. So, so here's, a, here's an ethos. You, you could say, despite the catastrophe of life, I'm going to do good. That's an interesting way of thinking about it, right? Because you could, you could admit that the conditions of existence are in some sense terrible enough to justify your cynicism and bitterness and resentment, maybe even to justify you working against the structure of existence itself. But you could decide in some sense that despite the evidence, that's one way of thinking about it, you're not going to do that, that you're going to do what is right and good regardless. And then, and then you might ask, well, how do you move in that direction? How, if, if, if that's what you decide to do. If you don't decide to do that, then you work to make things worse. We have to keep that in mind. How would you move in that direction? Well, the opposite of resentment is gratitude. And so then maybe you look for things to be grateful about. And, and there's a humility in that, right? You have, to, you have to lower yourself enough until you start to see the things in your life that could be far worse than they are. And there are a lot of things like that. And then you have to will that you will adopt a positive attitude towards that fact. And then you could will that as a matter of courage, not as a matter of naivety. You could say that, despite it all, I'm going to practice being grateful. I'm going to have faith that that courageous practice will lead me in a positive direction. But even if it doesn't, I'm going to maintain that faith. And that's a decision. It's, it's not something you derive from the evidence, it's, and it's not a sacrifice of your re reason. It's, it's a decision based on faith in a certain principle. I think you, you do the same thing if you decide that you're going to abide by the truth. The decision has to be something like, I'm going to presume, I'm going to accept the presumption that the truth will set me free. And then I'm going to act in accordance with that principle. And I'm going to assume as well that whatever happens as a consequence of abiding by the truth is the best thing that could have possibly happened, regardless of how it makes itself manifest at the moment. Because you might say, well, you tell the truth and you get in trouble, the facts indicate that you should have used deception. It's like, well, which facts exactly? And over what span of time exactly? You know, every one child who lies, lies to get out of trouble. And it could easily be that a child who lies successfully avoids the trouble in the short term, and every child has had that experience. But that doesn't mean that we always tell our children, look kid, if you're in trouble, just lie. That'll do the trick. No one, virtually no one, no matter how corrupt, virtually no one is so corrupt they actually teach their children that explicitly. Because everyone knows in the deepest part of themselves that the probability you're going to get away with something is actually, it's actually zero. And there's virtually nothing more pathological that you can imagine than teaching your children to use deceit consciously to avoid the repercussions of their actions. So we know too that it's morally appropriate to Presume that the truth will set us free. That's a, an axiom of faith. Gratitude. It's the same. It's the same conundrum in some sense. Even if the fundamental truth of life is suffering, it's possible that a courageous attitude of gratitude will remediate the suffering. And I think that's true. You know. You know. You know. If you're around people and you do something 
you're around someone and you do something for them and they notice and they're grateful for it, then you're pretty happy about that because your contribution has been noted, but also you're more likely to duplicate that in the future. And so you could imagine that if you were sophisticated in your gratitude, because you practiced it diligently and became an expert at it, that you would respond to people when they made a gesture in your direction in such a compelling manner that the probability that would be repeated would increase vastly. And you know people like that, you know people like that perfectly well who are very, they're enticing in some sense to be around and the reason for that is that how they treat other people with respect and they respond to the positive things that other people do to them in a very sophisticated manner and, and because of that in some real sense they live a charmed life and it's also deserved that charmed life because they get they get what they invite and so you can make a case I tried to make a case in this chapter that you have every reason for cynicism and bitterness and you have every reason to for that to tilt you into a kind of arrogant resentment. But it's conceivable that you could will or desire the strength of character that would require you to aim up positively despite the depth of your knowledge of the catastrophe of life. And it's also possible that if you did that elegantly and you practiced that, that that would be the best remediation for exactly the problem that you face to begin with. And so then, gratitude like humility becomes a matter of courage and will and faith rather than a mere secondary consequence of a counterproductive naivety. Now, We, we come from a tradition of religious practice. We really don't know what that means anymore. We don't, we don't know what practice means. We think about it in some sense as empty ritual. And, and it can become empty ritual. But practice, practice means perfect, right? You become what you practice. And we even know how that works in some sense. So if you undertake a new task, imagine I placed someone who was learning a new task in a in a, in a sophisticated machine that could measure the activity in their brain. What you see to begin with is when you first do something, very large areas of your, very large swaths of neural territory are activated simultaneously. That's why it's effortful to do something new. But then imagine you repeat that over and over. What happens is that the pattern of activity starts to shrink. It shrinks from the right side to the left and then it shrinks from the front of the left back, and as it shrinks, it becomes smaller and smaller and more and more focal until all the activity is in a little constructed machine that now runs automatically, that does nothing but what you just practiced. And then it's, then it's part of you. It's built into you. And so you do genuinely become what you practice. You become you become implicitly even what you practice. It starts to run in the background as, as, as part of who you are without even thinking. And so then you might ask yourself, well, what would happen if you practice being grateful in the face of suffering and malevolence? And the answer is, maybe you'd become an expert at it. And then you might say, well, what might be the benefit of that? And it might be that the practice of that gratitude in the face of suffering would actually be part of the antidote to the suffering itself. Really, not merely metaphysically or, or conceptually, but actually. It would, if you practiced that and you became expert at it, it would spin the world around on its axis so that much of what there was that had tormented you would vanish or reverse. And then you might say, well, how do you find that out? And the answer is, well, you stake your life on it, right? Because you don't have the evidence beforehand, and if you're going to find out if that's the case, you're going to have to manifest the faith necessary to motivate the practice. 
And so that's the requirement of faith, and that's allied. I would say, I really believe this, and it's good to know this, that's allied not with naivety, that is allied with courage. And so I think gratitude in the most fundamental sense is an expression of the courage to be, and, and more, the courage to be good in spite of it all, and to see good and to facilitate it in spite of it all. And I think that that's a, that's a decision that you could make, and that if, and that the more deeply you commit yourself to that decision, the more probable it is that the good that you had faith in would actually manifest itself. I think that in some real sense is how we bring good into the world. So it's a, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Or is it more the adoption of an attitude that allows what's best to make itself manifest? I think it's more the latter. You know, I have learned as a clinician, and I'll stop with this and turn to the Q&As. I have learned as a clinician, you know, that you can conjure out of someone, even someone quite bent and twisted, the best part of them if you conduct yourself in a sophisticated and careful manner around them. Right? There is ways of approaching even complex situations that are much more likely to tilt them in a positive direction than a negative direction. And we have no idea how deep that runs. You know, if you were an expert at gratitude, let's say, if you're an expert at truth, expert at love, what would the world be like then around you? It's an experiment worth running, possibly. Well, that's a case I tried to make in, in that chapter. Be grateful in spite of your suffering. It was very useful for me to see that you could construe gratitude as courage. You know, that makes it a noble pursuit then, right? It's got a martial spirit to it. And it's a strange thing, because you would never think of gratitude as something martial, as something warlike in some sense. But I think in its essence it is, because you array yourself in gratitude against one vicious opponent. And so that's why perhaps you should be, you should strive, you should consider striving to be grateful in spite of your suffering. Thank you very much. finds useful in it, and uh, I'll invite him back on stage, Dr. Peterson. Articulate. Mm. 
What would you recommend to a one who wants to learn to speak in a more articulate manner? Well, articulate is an interesting word, eh? Because if your joints are articulated, and that means you can do things with them, because they're articulated, they're not one solid, vague mass. They're differentiated. And someone who's graceful is articulated. And compelling because they're articulated. And speech is a form of articulation in that manner because the act of speech itself is extremely complicated. It's a very complicated motor activity, right? It's a very complicated action to dance with your tongue, let's say. And it is definitely the case that there is no more exceptional form of the capacity to be dangerous than to be articulate. And one of the things that really shocks me, part of the reason that my son and I and our co-workers developed this essay out is that young men in particular are never taught this. So, well, why learn to, why be literate? Well, do you, do you want to be, do you want to be competent and dangerous or do you want to be vague and useless? Because those are your options and I don't care what your job is, it doesn't matter what you end up doing. You know, if you're a plumber, great respect for plumbers by the way, and you're articulate, you can negotiate with your clients, you can introduce your co-workers, you can, you can make a case for your employees, you can, you can advertise your services, you can think through your problems, you're, you're firing on all cylinders. There, you know, our whole culture is based on the idea of the supremacy of the word. Our whole culture is based on the idea that it is the word itself that extracts habitable order from chaos and possibility. And, and the reason our culture is predicated on that is because it's a deep truth. And to the degree that our culture actually embodies that, it works. So, it's a great thing to be articulate. And it would be so lovely if our educators were wise enough to communicate this appropriately to young men who are striving forward and to let them know in no uncertain terms that if they want to make themselves into forces to be contended with that there's no surer route to that than an exceptional poetic literacy now it's not like young people don't have an intuition of this there are reasons they admire rap musicians, for example, who are often extraordinarily articulate in their performance and their capacity for spontaneous poetic utterance. And certainly, the greatest people I've met, including great warriors, you might say, are great in no small part because they're articulate. I know a, a former special services Special Operations soldier Jocko Willink. Some of you might know about Jocko. Um, he's got a pretty decent online following, and you know, he's about four feet wide and about three feet thick, and he's one tough son of a bitch. I'll tell you, you don't want to mess with him, and he knows perfectly well and is very capable of articulating the fact that his success as an eminent warrior is in no, no small part dependent on his ability to communicate. Because he could communicate well, he could listen to the men un who were under his command. Because he was articulate, he could explain to his superiors the situation on the ground. Because he was articulate, he could make a case that the men under his command who were deserving would be promoted. Because he could think in an articulate manner, he could plan strategically and not lose battles. Okay, so that's the case for being articulate. And what's the alternative? You want to be inarticulate? You want to say ah, and like, and mmm, and pause, and stumble, and, and, and be unable to formulate a strategy, be unable to elucidate a vision, be unable to compel? and convince other people to entice them with, with, your, with your 
articulated vision of what might be? You want the opposite of that? That's, why would you want that? You would, you, you would, you would choose awkwardness over grace? That's, it's preposterous. It's, it's beyond foolish. And I cannot understand for the life of me why this case isn't made in a compelling manner, particularly to young men. And I know it's not being articulated to young men because they're dropping out of the educational realm in droves. And it's unbelievably sad. So, how do you become articulate? Well, by paying attention to what you say. That's a good start. And what do I mean by that? I mean pay attention to what you say. So, you can, you can, you can think of this as an analogy. So, imagine that you're trying to walk across a swamp and the swamp is murky. But you know there's a path. You know there's a, a path of stone under the water, but it twists and moves. And if you stay on the path, you won't drown. The crocodiles in the swamp won't devour you. And as you walk forward, you can feel with your, with your next step where the stone might be. And then you feel it's solid, then you take that step, and then you do the same thing with your foot again. You search, and, and you find out what's solid, and you step on it, and you move forward in that manner. That's what you do with your words. It's the same thing. You feel, and you, you feel, is this the right word? Is, it, is the fact that I'm uttering it putting me together and making me intact and stronger, or is it tearing me apart and making me dissolute and weak? And, and you can learn to do that. I learned this in part from reading Carl Rogers, who's a great clinician, and Rogers believed that the integration of language and action was a necessary precondition for operation as an effective clinician, that you had to align what you said with who you were, and that one of the things that your clients would be evaluating you for was that capability. And you might say that someone with that capability manifest themselves as genuine and trustworthy. And, and more than that, I would say also as compelling and interesting, although that can be gamed, but the entire combination that emerges out of the domain of articulate communication can't be gamed. It's not, not easily. You feel your way. I noticed 40 years ago, when I started thinking these things through, that much of what I said actually made me feel weak. I didn't know why exactly, but sometimes some of the things I said didn't have that effect. They, they weren't accompanied by a sense of shame, let's say. They weren't accompanied with a sense of vulnerability. They were solid. And at the beginning, that was probably only about 5% of what I said. The rest of it was instrumental, you know, it was language I was using to get my way in the manner that Tammy described when she introduced me tonight. There was an arrogance in my use of language that had to do with the desire to attain proximal victories, right? To appear smart, let's say, to win an argument, something like that. A very different idea than merely feeling my way along to see what word was appropriate for what moment. But you can learn to do that. And you can listen to yourself, and you can stop humming and hawing and using like and you know and fillers. And you can take the time necessary to craft your words carefully. And you can practice merely saying what you believe to be true. And you can read. And you can read great writers, and you can write and you can write about what you think about the problems that obsess you. And you can become articulate as a consequence. And there'll be nothing about that that isn't the adventure of your life. And so it's a moral endeavor in some real sense. Right, to 
become articulate is to become the master of your own tongue and to become properly articulate is to is to make the word divine and to treat it in that manner and to decide whether or not you believe that it is the case that the divine word creates the order that's habitable and good and if you do believe that well if you don't believe that then what do you believe and if you do believe that well go all in see what happens see what happens if you become articulate said she'd learned to pause. You can pause. It's, it's a prayerful pause in some sense. When you're in a discussion with someone, you can ask yourself. They might present you with a question or a conundrum or a proposition. And instead of responding with what you know to be right, so to speak, you could just ask yourself, what do I actually think about that? But it has to be a real question. It has to be the kind of question that you posed to someone you didn't know. It has to be a question predicated on the idea that you might not know who you are and that you could ask. And so someone will present you with a question, you think, okay, what do I think about that? But you have to want to know the answer and then the answer will make itself known because that's how thought works and then you can just communicate that answer. And and if you do that, you'll be interesting right away. You'll be interesting to the person that you're talking to. And if they do that to you, they'll be interesting too. And then if you both do that, you'll have an interesting conversation. And if you have an interesting conversation, you'll both grow as a consequence. And that's actually the pathway to growth. And you just wait. You can wait. You can open yourself up to the possibility that what needs to be said will make itself manifest. If that's what you are striving for, if that's what you're asking for. And then you can merely communicate that. You have to abandon instrumentality to do that. So one of the reasons Joe Rogan is so successful, by the way, is that that's what Joe does. He just asks questions. He, he, doesn't, he isn't trying to get something from his guests. He's not trying to become more famous. He doesn't need any more money. There's no instrumental utilization of language in his discourse. He's just a humble lunkhead, you know, in the most profound sense, who would like to know more than he knows, and who asks all the stupid questions he can think up. And it turns out that he's actually very, very smart and, and very well educated now, for, after talking to hundreds and hundreds of people and listening. And so the stupid questions he asks aren't stupid, and they're questions that are shared by virtually everyone who's listening. And he takes his listeners along on this process of exploratory endeavor, and it's the pathway to success. And that, the same thing can be true of your life. The pathway to success is, is much, it's a, If you're guided by the spirit of honest inquiry and every word you say is reflective of what you believe to be the truth, then the pathway that you walk on is a golden pathway to success. And, and I, I know that. I know that to be true. by the rules or it'll turn into a free-for-all so we're going to do it this way Shut up, Go ahead. how has the normalization of pornography and explicit sexual content affected today's society well I'll tell, I'll tell you something that you might not know 
this is quite interesting. So, I studied antisocial personality for a long time, uh, mostly at McGill, although I, I kept, so that was for about seven years, and then I kept my hand in the literature for decades after that, and I studied male antisocial behavior and female antisocial behavior. The patterns are, they overlap, but they have good distinctions. And uh, I know the, there's a constellation of symptoms, so to speak, that make up criminal behavior and its precursors. And the essence of criminal behavior is predatory parasitism. And so that's really the definition of psychopathy. So a predator is obviously someone who will take from you what is yours. And a parasite is someone who will manipulate you into working for their advantage. And a predatory parasite is a psychopath. And then you can decorate the psychopathy in various ways. So if you're an extroverted parasitic predator, then you're a charming psychopath. And if you're an extroverted, non-neurotic, non-neurotic predatory parasite, then you're a fearless, charming psychopath. And that would make you a movie villain. Right, because the, the psychopaths that you see portrayed as supervillains in some sense are extroverted, non-neurotic, so fearless, predatory parasites. And they have the same charm that a cobra has. And so, now most people who are antisocial aren't antisocial to that degree. There are other patterns of behavior and attitude that are associated with that tilt towards criminal exploitation. And one of them is early sexual experience of multiple sexual partners. And so it turns out that the constellation of symptoms that's associated with criminality and its extension into psychopathy is also associated with short-term mating strategies, promiscuity. So, so what does pornography do? Well, that's pretty self-evident once you know those other facts. It's like it tilts people hard towards a short-term mating outlook, and that's a bad idea. So it's, it's not a good idea to employ sexuality in the services of short-term gratification. Why? Because short-term gratification is a bad strategy. Why? Because short-term gratification doesn't iterate well, and you know this. This is why it's not that good an idea to overuse cocaine. It's like, well, it's a great drug. It activates the system that is at the base of positive emotion itself. That's what it does, technically. Why not use it? Because, you know, people, people, psychologists, researchers think, well, why do people use drugs? That's a stupid question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. We absolutely know why people use drugs. What we don't know is why everyone doesn't use them all the time. <laughs> so, so, and here's how we know this, for example. There, there are three broad categories of drugs of abuse. There's the anti-anxiety drugs, alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. And there's the psychomotor stimulants, and that's cocaine and amphetamines, essentially, methamphetamine as well. And there's the opiates, which are analgesic. Now, we'll leave the hallucinogens aside because they're a strange category, and, and, and they, they're, they're not, they're not, technically, they're not drugs of abuse, and there are reasons for that. Um, but cocaine certainly is. Now, what does cocaine do? Well, you have a biological system within you that is activated when you're moving towards valuable goals. And the subjective experience of activation of that system is positive emotion, it's enthusiasm, it's engagement, it's the sense that you're doing something vital and meaningful. And cocaine and drugs like it activate that system. So it's no mystery at all why people will use cocaine. Well, so what happens if you use it all the time? The answer is you go downhill very, very rapidly. And short-term impulsive hedonic gratification is not a strategy that iterates well across time. And short-term sexual 
gratification strategies have exactly the same problem. Now, imagine this is happening more and more commonly, by the way. So, as women free themselves from the shackles of monogamous relationships and are more likely to engage in short-term mating strategies, you might think that's a very good thing for men. Uh, but it turns out it's not such a good thing for men because women are quite picky. And so women rate 80% of men online as below average in attractiveness. And whereas men rate 50% of women as below average attractiveness, which by the way is true, right? Statistically. But it's 80% of men. And so what that means is that the attention of women in an open mating market is focused on a very small percentage of men. And what's happening in colleges and universities where women dominate in terms of proportion of population is that all the women are chasing a very small number of men. So most of the men have no partners at all. And some of the men have more partners than they know what to do with. And so those men pursue short-term mating strategies, which is not so good for the women because they just as soon have an actual relationship. But then you might ask, well, what does it do to the men? And that's easy, is that it trains them to adopt antisocial short-term mating strategies. And that's really bad practice. Because if you practice exploiting people for your momentary gratification, then you'll become an expert at that. And that's an antisocial slash psychopathic mode of interaction. And you might say, so what? Look at all the sex. And the answer is, well, that's just not going to work out very well for you as you try to build yourself something approximating a, a stable and fulfilling life. Because you are not going to be able to do that if you treat other people as if they're the device for your momentary gratification. No one who's sophisticated in any real sense is going to put up with that. And so it might work well in the short term, but it's a absolutely cataclysmically dreadful medium to long term strategy. We know this too because psychopaths use strategy like that because they're predatory parasites. And to be a successful psychopath, unless you operate online, which is where most psychopaths operate now, you have to keep moving. You might say, well, everyone successful is a psychopath. It's like, no, that, that's actually wrong. Psychopaths are rarely successful. They're somewhat more successful than people who don't do anything. But in order to maintain any success at all, they have to be itinerant. Because if you're a predatory parasite and you manipulate other people, they figure it out and then they remember who you are and people are very good at remembering those things and then your reputation is damaged as a consequence of the truth and then in order to continue operating successfully as a psychopath you have to go somewhere else. So, back to pornography. Well, first of all, it's, it's a surfeit of hedonistic pleasure. It's whim-based doesn't constitute the kind of action that lays the groundwork for functional relationships. It stops you from being desperate enough to go and put yourself on the line in a real relationship. It trains you sexually to respond only to pornography. It requires that you use more and more novel forms of pornography as your habit develops in order to get the same kick, it increases the probability of impotence in real life. There's nothing about it that's good. And then the fact of its wide distribution online, let's say, also entices girls into the kind of quasi-prostitution that characterizes, you know, only fans and sites like that. So, now this isn't a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing. So, uh, <laughs> pornography deprives you of optimal deprivation. That's a good way of thinking about it, because you've got to ask yourself, you know, if you're going to go out there and establish a genuine relationship, how bloody desperate do you need to be? And the answer is, not zero desperate. 
and pornography enables zero desperation. And life is too hard for zero desperation to be the right amount of motivation. So it's an easy way out. And it's, it's an easy way out in the short term. Yeah. How do we continue to encourage children to question and develop their own moral compass in a world that is so determined to tell us what to think? I think probably in, in your own home, you just encourage that kind of behavior. You know, I mean, I think one of the things we did reasonably well with our kids was encourage them to, to think, to listen to them, right? And negotiate it with them. And so if you model that in your home, first of all, that'll alert them to the difference between a functional home and a pathological learning environment. That's a good thing for them to learn. And second, you can help them become sophisticated in their capacity to articulate themselves. A lot of that with kids, I would say, and then this is true for the other people in your life too, is, you know, you might think as a parent, well, I'm not that articulate, how can I help my children? And I would say, listen to them. And if, they're, if you don't understand what they're telling you, ask them some questions and get them to represent what they're attempting to communicate clearly. You can do people a world of good by listening to them. It's, there's almost nothing you can do for someone that is more productive and generous than to listen to them. And I, I can tell you a little strategy. This is a good one. This is also from Carl Rogers. This is a very good strategy. Try this with your wife or your husband. You could, you could make this a rule. It's about the only psychological technique that I know that actually works. because. Most of what constitutes psychological technique is too sophisticated to boil down into something like a procedure, you know, without it becoming false. But this works. So imagine, here's the rule. I'm going to listen to you. We're discussing some problem we want to solve. I'm going to listen to you. And then I'm going to wait till you tell me that you're done talking, right? So you've said what you have to say. And I'm going to leave that up to you. And then I'm going to tell you what you just told me. But here's the rule. You have to agree with my formulation. And so what are you doing then? Well, first of all, say you talk to me for 10 minutes and then I reflect back to you what you said. I'm not going to take 10 minutes to do that. I'm going to have reduced it to its gist. It's sort of like extracting the punchline out of a joke, right? If you, if you go tell someone else about a conversation that you have, you don't re duplicate the whole conversation. You reduce it by some mysterious means to its essence and you communicate that. So one of the things you do for someone, if you do this, is to reflect back to them the essence of what they said. And if you get that right, they're pretty damn happy with you because part of what they're trying to do when they're communicating is to reduce what they're communicating to its essence. And so then if you allow them to be the determining judge of whether or not what you reflect back is accurate, then you also indicate to them extraordinarily clearly that you actually listened and understood. And even if you're arguing with someone, they're so thrilled that you did that, that half of their annoyance with you will disappear right there and then. You think, oh my God, you actually listened. And, you know, I have people in my clinical practice who'd never been listened to ever in their life by anyone. Not their parents, they have no friends, their parents never listened to them, they have no friends, and nobody close to them. They were so incoherent and inarticulate and so and suffering from such a backlog of non-communication that it was a miracle to see. And it would take those people thousands of hours, thousands of hours, to lay out what they had to say. And so, and no one had ever listened to them. You can help people by listening to them in a manner you can hardly imagine. Because what you're doing when you're listening to them is you're actually allowing them to 
to speak themselves into existence in some real sense. Why are they talking to you? Because they want to get something straight. And, and why don't they just do that by themselves? It's because most people can't do that by themselves. In fact, I don't know if anybody can really do it by themselves. You, 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 we think by talking. And even when we think by ourselves, we talk, you know, you know it, it, it's, it, it's internalized, it's still a dialogue. Almost everyone speak, thinks by speaking. And so if they have no one to listen, then they can't think. And if they can't think, then they fall into a pit. And so if you listen, then you facilitate their thinking and you can, you can encourage them to speak and think by your careful attention, you can indicate your careful attention by your capacity to reflect and summarize. So you try that, try that, as, try that in your life. And just every time you listen to someone from now on, it's like they go off on some communicative tangent. You say, this is what I think you said. Did I get it right? And maybe they say, well, no, not exactly. Here's what I really meant. You know, there might be some tussling about the precise meaning of the utterance, but I'll tell you, man, people will be thrilled with you if you can do that. And they will. Here's something else that's ridiculously cool about this. If you're bored by people, you are not listening to them. If you listen to them, they will get so interesting that you want to run away from them. Because if you listen to people, they will tell you everything. And that's really something, because once people start to reveal themselves, they get so interesting that it's almost unbearable. It's one of the things I loved about being a clinician, because I could, I could listen to people, and they would tell me who they were, and wow, that was quite the trip, man. Because people are very strange, and, <laughs> and mysterious, and remarkable, and even simple people, you know, who, who weren't, who weren't sophisticated in any philosophical sense, they weren't educated, Man, if you could get them telling their story, they're so damn interesting that it's unbearable. And so, and if, and you'll know people so well if you listen to them, because they will tell you who they are. And they'll be so happy with you that you're there to allow them to think things through, to facilitate that process. They'll flock to you and you'll learn so much. It's so useful, and this is such a good technique. This works so well, and you can you can learn it pretty quickly, and you can implement it. In, you know, in your own relationship, that's the rule. It's like you get to talk. I'll tell you what you said until you agree with my summary. Then it's my turn. You do the same. Roger said, if you do that with your partner, your wife or your husband, you'll find that 80% of what you're arguing about will vanish just as a consequence of the process. And then what you'll have left is the actual problem, you know, because you guys might be working out a real problem. But at least you'll only be working out the problem. You won't be facing the consequences of failure to communicate. And you'll have also signaled to each other that, in a deep sense, that each, each of you are acting out the proposition that what the other has to say is worth attending to. And, there's nothing that people need and want more than to be attended to. That's, attention is everything. That's why advertisers pay for it. So, one more, and then done. One more. Hopefully short, because otherwise I'm in trouble. What is your motivation for being here tonight? What is my motivation for being here tonight? Well, it, it was, it was, the fundamental motivation is to, is exactly what you'd expect. What you've observed from being here, hopefully, is that I have this proposition, right? Be grateful in spite of your suffering, and it's a complex proposition. And I understand its utility to some degree, but it's a complex and deep proposition, and it's worth exploring, because it's possible to get deeper into the proposition. And so what I try to do in these lectures is to take a compelling problem and to see if I can get further in its explication for me and, and then also for whoever I'm communicating with. And so that's the, 
that's the goal and the aim and I understand that if I do that properly then we'll share that process of exploration and I can walk myself towards a place of deeper understanding and with God's grace let's say and careful articulation I can bring everybody along on that voyage and there isn't anything better than that and so and it's, it's salutary and and redemptive in some fundamental sense there's 13,000 of you here tonight it's like what are you doing here and the answer is something like you're trying to aim up at least to some degree and I'm trying to aim up too and we're jointly communicating how we might individually and collectively manage that and there isn't anything better than that really and so and there isn't anything better than this and so thank you very much for coming Thank you.